anyone who talks to me for more than five minutes walks away knowing two things. I love my family, and my hometown is Birmingham, Alabama. I was raised in a very loving and supportive home. My father, my father was a Baptist preacher who told me at the end of our chat about the birds and the bees, he said, Reginald, only a coward hits a woman. Always respect women. And my mother, my mother was a saint. My mother told me she loved me every single day of my life. And she also told me, don't ever let someone make you hate them. And our neighborhood was very close as well. I grew up in the kind of community where if you needed help or a favor or just a good laugh, they were there too. And I'm happy to announce that in its most recent election, Birmingham chose as its mayor, Randall Woodfin, a 36-year-old African-American. 36 years old. I have vinyl records at home that are older than 36 years old. But my hometown also has a very dark past. You see, I was raised in the segregated Jim Crow era of the South. Legalized racism. White and colored signs clouded my, my childhood. They were everywhere, on the restrooms. And if you were out in public and you wanted a simple drink of water, you were greeted by white and colored signs over the water fountain. And one of America's worst terrorist attacks also occurred in my hometown. The bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church, where four little girls were killed by a bomb planted by the Ku Klux Klan while attending Sunday school. And if I may, on a personal note, one of those four little girls, Denise McNair, she lived just down the street from me. These were tough times, and we had to grow up fast. My parents told me, if you got a great education, that's how you change the world. And I listened to them. I attended Miles College, a wonderful, historically black university, 20 minutes from my house. I even made the dean's list. I, I majored in communications. And through the Miles College Communications Department, I earned an internship with the local NBC TV studio, WVTM Channel 13. And shortly after my internship ended, I was hired as a full-time cameraman. And that's how my career as a cameraman started. So after five great years at Channel 13 of filming news, sports, and weather, I had a burning desire to move to a larger city, to work in a bigger TV market. And knowing this, one of my work colleagues told me about this brand new 24-hour cable news network, and that they were hiring cameramen in their Washington, D.C. bureau. And I said, that's great. What's cable? <laughs> Today, we can't imagine a world where there's not 24-hour news, sports, weather, cooking shows, you name it, they got it. But this is the early 80s, and CNN was the first. And I'm proud to say that I was a part of TV history. As Ann said in her very gracious uh, introduction, for the past 32 years, I was a cameraman at CNN, and I had the great honor of filming every United States president from Reagan to Obama. And one such presidential trip took place right here in Dublin over 30 years ago when President Ronald Reagan visited Ireland in 1984. And one of my assignments on that, uh, that great trip was to set up for a live broadcast in a beautiful park near Trinity College, not too far from here. And a crowd of about 50 or so townspeople gathered to watch us set up 
And as I had done throughout my TV career, if there was a crowd and if I had time, I would always try to pick a small child out of the audience and make them an honorary CNN reporter. Because you never know who you're going to inspire. So as I'm scanning the crowd, I see this young boy with the happiest smile I'd ever seen. So I wave him over, and he comes over, and I ask him, how old is he? And he says, nine years old. I said, great, you meet the union requirement. <laughs> so I gave him a couple of microphone cables to plug in, and I even had him turn on our light switch, and I put him on a small box that the real CNN reporter would eventually stand on. And then I gave him the CNN microphone. And automatically, this kid went testing, one, two, three, testing. <laughs> he was a natural, and the crowd applauded. So now it's about time for the reporter to come, and I wish the young lad well, and I thanked him for his, uh, his efforts. And he see, as he starts to walk away, it dawned on me that I'd never asked him his name. So I said, young man, what's your name? And he turns and says, Martin. And I said, Martin, that's a great name. And he said, thank you. My mom named me after her hero, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Thank you. I felt the same way. I stood there frozen. And I couldn't help it. Tears welled up in my eyes. Reason being, I was nine years old when the Alabama state troopers brutally beat hundreds of peaceful protesters marching across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama. Selma, just like my last name. Their crime, going to register to vote. And that awful day became known as Bloody Sunday. Yeah, America and Ireland share this name of pain. And speaking of pain, I hold in my hand two receipts dated 1964, made out to my father, Reverend Joseph Selma, for $15. And my dear sweet mother, Mrs. Willie Lee Selma, $15, a total of $30. In today's economy, I guess that's around 220 year old. This was called a poll tax. Because if you were black and you wanted to vote during this time in the South, the local government forced you to pay money. Very, very sad. So as I stood there talking to this young, this young lad, I thought about my father. Earlier I said my father was a Baptist preacher. His church was less than two miles from the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And two weeks after Bloody Sunday, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. led another peaceful protest, this time thousands. And this time they were not denied. That march went on to change America. No, that march changed the world. Due to that march and other acts of courage, in 1982, I became CNN's first African-American cameraman assigned to the White House. Yeah, thank you. So as I'm standing in Dublin over 30 years ago, talking to this bright-eyed Irish lad with tears rolling down my face, the reason I was so emotional that day, it seemed as if he connected to my nine-year-old self. I saw in him my spirit when I was nine years old. And all of a sudden, I heard someone call my name. And I turned around, and it was my, my reporter, who's now standing on that box, and the rest of my crew saying, Reggie, 
We have 30 seconds before we're live. So I run over to my video camera and I put on my headset. And I, I made it in the nick of time. And then I turn to find Martin. At this point, the crowd had become larger and he disappeared into the crowd. That was the last time I saw him. And it's been a dream of mine ever since that someday I would return to Dublin and I would find Martin. He'd be a grown man of, in his early 40s by now. And I wanted to find him and I wanted to say, Martin, you're my hero too. So perhaps you could help me in this endeavor <laughs> with your advanced set of STEM skills. Perhaps you could post this story of me looking for Martin on your various social media platforms. But also, I am a person that believes in speaking goodness into existence. And I'm going to really need your help on this one. I want everyone in this beautiful theater to stand on your feet right now. Come on, I'm the son of a preacher man. We believe in making a joyful noise. <laughs> and on three, I want you to repeat, I want you to scream to the rafters and beyond. Martin, Reggie's back. <laughs> Martin. Reggie's back. Can you do that? Yes. Inspire Fest, are you ready? Yes. Are you ready? Yes. One, two, three. Martin, Reggie's back. One more time. 